Hey, everybody, welcome to the Raw Online Report. Today's guest, one of my favorite people of all time, not just in this industry. He is totally awesome. He is eight time Mr. Olympia champion. Joining us all the way from Georgia in the United States, please welcome the great Lee Haney. How are you, sir? I'm doing fantastic, Ron. How about yourself, my man? Doing well. Lee, I thought of a statistic because you were the only man who won eight Olympias and retired at the age of 31. That's a baby in bodybuilding today. And I said, we're never going to see that happen again. And we'll never, we probably never will see that with a Mr. Olympia. But Chris Bumstead, who is right now the classic physique Olympia champion four times, if he wins four more times, he'll be 31 years old uh, with eight wins, and then he can retire too. <laughs> yeah, the age of 31, just like I was. <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. It's, not, it's not the Mr. Olympia, but you know, to a lot of these young kids out there, the young guys, classic physique Olympia is just as important to them, if not way. A lot of them care more about classic now than they do open bodybuilding. Well, man, that's a fact because classic physique is classic bodybuilding. Just rename it. Yeah. You know, it, it's bodybuilding as it was meant to be. It was bodybuilding as it was, as I saw it growing up. Because, man, when I first saw Arnold, you know, at the first Olympia in Columbus, Ohio, in his plaid shirt, he looked great wearing his jeans. Yeah. Then, you know, you, you you see Frank Zane. You see all these, uh, uh, Casey Vietor. Yeah. Uh, uh, Pete oh. Gromkowski. It was just mind blowing. Seeing Robbie seeing all these beautiful athletes. Yeah. So that just totally blew me away and drew me in as a youngster. And so that is bodybuilding. You know, it was a, it was a uh, the thought of health and the thought of fitness as Joe Weider uh, created it to be. You know, not just Joe. You you also talk about uh, Dan Lurie. You also talk about. Uh, Perry Rader and all of these people with the magazines that helped to educate us as it relates to bodybuilding and the science of it. Yeah. Yeah. So health is what we're sort of here to talk about today. And it seems like I always come to you when it's when it's time to really educate people about health and longevity, because you're a prime example of that. You're over 60 years old now. You're in great health for the most part. We'll get into something that you that you confided in me before, but it's not bodybuilding related. But you know, we have lost even more people. We lost a lot of people during the pandemic, but it's still happening. We just lost a, a lovely woman named Amy Richardson. And bodybuilders shouldn't be, we should be a shining beacon of health and fitness and, you know, vitality. Nobody should be dying but under the age of 70, for goodness sake. But we have people in their 30s and 40s passing away on a fairly regular basis now. And one thing we, we had a conversation earlier today talking about a very unsafe practice and I don't know who to point the finger at, but that's what I guess we'll get into, whether it's the fans, the judges, the athletes, is conditioning has become such a, it's it's gotten to such a standard that if you're not completely dried out, like a piece of beef jerky, completely dried out, not just taking the body fat, all the body fat off your body, getting rid of all the water for this really elusive look that very few can even nail for more than an hour or two. But it does, it's it's called the dry look. And what does dry mean? It means what 70% of our body is water. It means we're losing a huge percentage of the of the water inside our cells and our organs and everything that our bodies need to survive to live. Uh, and you know, I I, I want to confess that I'm part of the problem because as a someone who goes to these shows and critiques the athletes. I'll say someone's off if they're holding a little water, or I'll say they could have been drier. So you know, I'm, I'm part of the problem too, but you know, what, what really caught your attention about this subject and what made you want to talk about this today, Lee? Well, man, as you, as you were saying, Ron, a lot of athletes uh, end up sick, uh, end up dying because of trying to achieve that level of dryness. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to change the culture of the mindset of what's happening when it comes to judging these competitions. I mean, athletes are doing what they're asked to do. And so I think there need to be a holdback or a pullback from that type of conditioning because it's just too dangerous. At the end of the day, you want to enjoy yourself as an athlete, but you want to walk away with your health. You shouldn't have to die in order to reach this level of conditioning. So they're asking too much of the athletes, period. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 
you look at the former school of body people say old school that is the real school it is the school forget that old school <laughs> let's say mature school yeah, okay. <laughs> i don't want to be thought of being old no. but you know we reached a level of conditioning that still allowed us to walk away after the competition and still be alive and still be healthy I mean, you look at the longevity of people like Bill Pearl, who was 90 when he passed. You look at uh, people like uh, Chris Dickerson. Chris was in his 80s. You look at uh, you look at, you know, people like Dave Draper. Dave was, I think, 79, but close to 80. Yeah. You know, so you look at these these athletes that come from that that lineage of bodybuilding. They live long, productive healthy lives. You look at Frank Zane. Frank, I think, is around 78. Robbie is 75. You know, Arnold is 75 plus, I believe. Albert Beckles is 90. Yeah. So what is that saying? It's saying that the practice of bodybuilding, the practice of nutritional, the practice of conditioning will far better during that era. And the demands was not as rigid as they are today. So I want to talk about how I achieved my level of conditioning because I didn't just pull this out of the sky. I learned from some of the greatest icons in the sport who taught me the ins and outs of how to get conditioned without tearing myself up. Then that was complimented by judges who would say, that looks great. They didn't say, you got to be drier. You got to be a little bit more tighter. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, an athlete saw, uh, 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 being, I mean, they're not using a lot of wisdom by listening to some of these so-called coaches mm -hmm. who push them to those levels. So you got a problem here. You got coaches and judges that are asking these crazy demands of the athletes. And listen, I want all athletes at the end of the day to be alive. I want them to, to live long, productive life as I have. Yeah. I'm not you know, I, I'm not, I haven't torn myself up, you know, having been an athlete and nor should the bodybuilders that exist today tear themselves up. I have to die to achieve those, yeah. you know, because, hey, you know, at the end of the day, what use is money when you're not here to enjoy or success when you're not here to enjoy? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of your, your era, Lee, and those, your contemporaries, I can't think of any that I'm sure some have died, you know, people die, but I'm thinking of, of how many of you are still alive, kicking and doing great yourself. Uh, Rich Gaspari, Lee Labrada, Barry DeMay, uh, Mike Christian. Mike Christian. None of us. Francis Samir Bernardo, Samir, you guys are all still bebopping. I see, I see a lot of these people at the expos. I follow them. He's Barry DeMay looks amazing right now. He's uh yeah. 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 Chris <laughs> Cremier, Chris you know, um, Sean, Sean Ray, all of these, all of us, man, during our era are still enjoying the fruits of our hard work and dedication, yeah. you know, and that should be the same, uh, same going forward. So some things has to change. It must change. And, you know, and, and I want to yield as much knowledge as I possibly can to this new generation of bodybuilders so that they can live out, you know, productive lives and not River with sickness, disease, and have to die prematurely trying to reach some unrealistic goal and the risk of trying to get there. Yeah. So before we get into how you achieved your, you know, your skin, we call it like shrink wrapped skin look, I do want to address the judging. You know, we're, it, it's kind of a tricky subject. People are afraid to talk about the judging because, oh no, you're going to get in trouble. You know, you're the powers of be are going to get mad at you and censor you and this and that. But, you know, you have nothing to lose at this point. But how do you say to the judges, listen, we can't, you guys cannot demand that these people have, a, you can't reward that look anymore because you're watching the Mr. Olympia. Here's the top six men in the Olympia. They all look amazing. They're all massive, beautiful physiques, the 10 best physiques on the planet. How do you, how do you start differentiating them? Conditioning always comes into that. It has to. So you're looking for extreme conditioning. How do you, how do you not reward extreme conditioning? Because obviously that's, you You got to split hairs when you got the very best people like that in front of you. Well, you have to, number one, have 
have the concern of the health of the athlete in mind. We know what extreme conditioning looks like, period. Particularly those who competed and those, the, those judges who've been there, done that for a while. They know what it should look like. They remember the era of Robbie Robinson or Frank Zane or Lee Haney or Rich Kaspari. They remember the fact that we were healthy. Nobody passed out on the stage. You know, you may have a guy, maybe got a little dehydrated. He got a little lightheaded, but nobody had to call in paramedics and that kind of thing to revive anybody. Mm. So, it, so there is a pattern that already exists. I'm saying let's get back to those patterns. It doesn't take a lot to do that. It just takes a joining of the minds because we got some incredible judges out there. They judged me. They they were part of the they they were a part of the growth of our industry. I think we have to step back and and rewrite, reassess. Because the blood of these athletes that are dying is on your hand. They're on your hand. And you're going to have to get an account of that, period. So I would, I, I would want to do what is right and reset and reestablish something that's healthy and something that's going to be positive for their entire sake of bodybuilding. Because, you know, each time one of us die, the media grab the hold to it. And it's, it's scaring people to death. You know, what parent, you know, would want their teenage, be it male or female, to participate in bodybuilding now yeah. because of what has happened? I wouldn't. You know, they wouldn't. I fell in love with bodybuilding when I was 11 years old. <laughs> and it's, it's all that I wanted to be, all that I wanted to do. But it was safe during that time. You never heard of heard of. What's been happening here lately? Right. So the judges have to take a step back, reassess, and go forward with a with a guideline of health and of wellness. That's easier said than done, but there's got to be a joining of the minds to make sure this happen. And what's been happening has to stop. It has to stop. And now the athletes have to also take responsibility of their health. Don't go there, you know, don't go there for, for no cause. Don't go there. Because I mean, at the end of the day, as I share with athletes when, I, when I'm out there run on the road, I say, listen, guys, I have eight Mr. Olympia trophies. I can't eat any of them. So the goal is to economize this hard work and dedication. You know, you look at Tom, Tom Platz is an awesome example. Tom never won the Mr. Olympia. But man, Tom, Tom went to the bank yeah. because of his charisma, because he was unique in his physique and what he displayed. I never heard of Tom passing out or being sick or anything like that. He took care of himself and, and we enjoyed the sport of bodybuilding that time. We laughed, we had fun, nobody died. So that, there need to be a reset, a reset of what's happening right now in our industry. So let's start before we get, I, I definitely want to get into how you, you did it so we can, hopefully people can emulate how your process, but diuretics are definitely the most dangerous, the dangerous drug being used by bodybuilders around contests because a diuretic, you know, like I always say, you can inject a bottle of test sipionate. It's not going to kill you today, but if you screw up with diuretics, you could die, you know, today in the next hour or two, you could be on a slab somewhere in a morgue. They tried diuretics testing many years ago and it failed uh, I think a couple of the guys that got popped, I remember like Jay Cutler threatened to sue because it wasn't following exact IOC procedures or something. So do you think, is that another option? Could they bring back diuretic testing? Or do you think the coaches and the athletes would just try to find ways around to beat the test? Well, the, you know, one thing that's, that's extremely dangerous, yes, diuretics, but the athletes, I've heard of several of them, just they stopped drinking water before a show. Yep. You know, they stop drinking water five, six days out from a show. Just mm -hmm. start sipping. That is not necessary. And it's totally ridiculous. And a lot of athletes are ending up with problems uh, as it relates to their kidneys and as it relates to their liver. Yep. That's not necessary. I was able to achieve the type of definition that I needed by just doing simple things 
like using, for instance, B6 supplement. B6 was acts as a natural diuretic. Then horsetail grass, which is a, a herbal type of natural diuretic. Yeah. Then I would train, uh, then I would use hot tea, English tea, uh, you know, with no sugar, which is a natural diuretic, or coffee. But the deal is when using things natural like that, it doesn't suck all of the minerals out of the body, which is important to keep the heart functioning properly. Then, uh, of course, I'm still drinking, but I'm not flooding my system, but I'm drinking to keep my body functional and healthy. Then we were trained in things like sweatshirts or garbage bags, just only during the time of the workout. When the workout is finished, we take it off. So we were able to sweat the water out. Not all the water. Still had water to keep, make sure the organs stayed healthy and was functional. So that was a trick I, I learned from Albert Beckers mm -hmm. and Johnny Fuller, which a lot of people don't even know John, about a Johnny Fuller. Great but Johnny British. taught British. me that. British guy. Yeah. Yeah. Hard, uh, ripped, grainy. Johnny was a whole nother world. And he said, Lee, look, when we're doing this, you got to make sure you have a good balance of magnesium and potassium. A three to one ratio, magnesium versus potassium. Mm -hmm. I learned during that time as I prepped for my 83 Miss Olympia, and I stayed with that same combination my entire time as I won the Olympia, you know, eight years in a row after that. But I learned that. So I've never had to do anything stupid like doing Lasix or uh, to discontinue drinking water. I've never had to do that. Yeah. Number one, when you keep your body fat at a certain level, you know, your muscularity is going to show through anyway. And then you would learn to manipulate the water by drinking water, hot tea, which flushes right through, it saves the minerals and get the job done without hurting yourself or bringing harm to your kidney or to your liver. It's yeah. very simple to do. And I talk about, about that in my book, uh, Totally Awesome. Mm -hmm. And though, so you got these goofy coaches out here. And athletes that draw to these crazy guys, you know, who don't know anything about competition, they're using you as a lab rat, and you end up harming yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I asked you if it was okay to ask this. So I'm going to ask you right now, Lee. You did you ever use a pharmaceutical diuretic for preparate for the end of any of your Mr. Olympia wins? Never doing all of the end. The one time I did was in 1983. And I made it all the way through the prejudging, but right at the end of prejudging, I started to cramp. Mm -hmm. And that's when Johnny Fuller gave me a very good lesson. He said, Lee, don't take diuretics. Lee, you have to fill your system with magnesium, three to one ratio to potassium. Mm -hmm. And I learned from that. I learned from watching Albert, Johnny. I never had to use it anymore. You know, and when I did do it, it was only a small amount, but I didn't need that. You know, you, you have a tendency to think you need those extra things, but you don't need them. So I never took another diuretic beyond 1983. It was a one time and it was the last time because I nearly cramped. I, I, <laughs> I, I've made it through prejudging, but I was just teetering on not being able to make it through. Yeah. Did, did you recall the story of that Olympia, 1983 Olympia Munich, Germany, where S Samir was the winner? But Samir, I don't know if it was the night before, he was going through extreme cramping, presumably from diuretics. And uh, the legend, the myth is that Mike Menzer came and gave him some minerals, magnesium or something, potassium, I don't know, and basically made it so that he was able to go on and win the competition. Did, did you ever hear that story? No, I, I never heard that. Yeah, I'm interested, guys, in the comments, because I, I don't, I, I hate, I hate being inaccurate in the comments. If anyone knows the, the true story, please leave it in the comments, because I'd like to be educated myself. So I guess, you know, Lee, people are going to listen to everything you just said and say, that's great, Lee, but nobody was looking for you to have strided glutes where you could see every muscle fiber in your gluteus maximus. And, you know, it looked like you could, the, the glute ham looked like you'd stick a freaking hand in there because the, the, the crevices are so deep. The standards have become so, so extreme now that that's expected. And we have guys with amazing physiques. Like I'm, sh I'm sure you're familiar with Andrew Jack, the new guy from, oh, yeah. uh, from Dubai by way of Nigeria. So Andrew was just eighth at the Olympia. 
And the only reason I think he was relegated that far down was because of his glutes and hams. They were, uh, here I go again, part, I'm part of the problem. His glutes and hams were soft. They weren't striated and dry and grainy, which would take extreme dehydration to achieve. But, you know, here I am with all the other critics and uh, armchair people sitting watching the show saying, ah, his glutes and hams aren't in. You know, how do we, once you've opened that Pandora's box and saying, this is the standard, how do you go back and, you know, say, no, we don't want that anymore. You don't have to look like that anymore. We don't want you. We don't want that extreme look. I got you. The true standard is this. I've never seen a set of butt cheeks win a show. Mm -hmm. Or it shouldn't be judged by a set of butt cheeks (laughs) and hamstrings only. Yeah. The the balance of the physique, symmetry, balance, muscle belly, shoulder and waist ratio, completeness should be the standard with good muscle separation. Mm. It doesn't have to be a striated set of butt cheeks. Okay. You, you, you see, so we've gotten off base. I've seen guys with great butt cheeks, but then I saw them with squatty legs that look like a power lifter. Yeah. I saw them with a wide blocky waist. You know, so all of a sudden, okay, so we got to go in that direction because that's the dry, hard look. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we throw out the window, the symmetry, the balance, you know, those things that makes a body beautiful. You know, so so there has to be a line drawn as to, okay, what we're looking for. And the look should be that of the Excalibur of physiques. Mm. You know, I've seen some beautiful physiques that didn't place as high because they didn't have stripes and in the butts and that kind of deal. Yeah. And yet it was given to a little square, blocky, trollish looking physique because it had all those various characteristics to it. So I think we need to get back to more of a balance. Well, it almost sounds like you're talking about the last, the recent Olympia. And, uh, and it's okay. We're just talking about physiques. We're not assassinating anyone's character or no, no. personal attack. We're just talking about physiques. And we all, we all have our own, you know, preference is what we like. Who are some of the guys that are competing in the Mr. Olympia right now, or even the last Olympia who feel you feel exemplify, you know, if you were a judge, this is probably someone I'd be looking at to give the Olympia crown to. Well, look, the, the, the young man, uh, I think it's the, uh, London who took second. Lunsford, Derek Lunsford. Yeah. I like the way Derek looked. Hmm. Derek had nice taper, nice lines. He, he looked great. Hmm. Period. And, and then, of course, Hadi came in, you know, with more muscle separation. What I saw in Hadi was more muscle maturity. Mm. That was the perfect deal. Yeah. I saw nothing wrong with Hadi's physique. You know, he don't, you know, he don't flow as well, but he is enough. You see what I'm saying? And yes, I agree that he should have won the Mr. Olympia. Okay. But, you know, he didn't look, he didn't have a squatty look. You know, uh, when you look at Remy, I think Remy the leg size is too big. It's just too big. And his calves are too small, period. You know, uh, I don't know what happened. I saw him weeks earlier, and I really felt because he had Dennis training him that he was going to just come in better than he actually did. But something went wrong. Something went terribly wrong. I don't know whether his, his body had fatigue. Because I, I will say this, if you push your body extremely hard the whole year, asking your receptors to stay, to, to, to continue to function at 100%, it's going to be a, a it's just not going to end well. You know, either your system is going to shut down or it's going to start to rebel. You have to set up, you have to do your training your condition and, and levels of cycles. Eight weeks, take a rest off. Eight weeks, take a rest off. Make sure you detox and clean the body so that when you do start your competition training, the system is on go and you won't have a system failure leading up to two weeks or a week before the show. Mm. That's, what I, that's what I feel happens to a lot of athletes yeah. where they have a system failure. You know, uh, but other than that, I I think if you train like a power lifter, you're going to look like a power lifter. I see a lot of guys doing real heavy deadlifts. We never did that to create symmetrical balance physiques. Mm -hmm. 
So guess what? They got these squatty, thick legs, big, wide waists like power lifters. Yeah. And so the shape and symmetry and so forth is, is, is not, you know, you, you end up compromising that, you know. And again, when you look at Chris, uh, you know, Chris Bump said, Chris looks great. He got the beautiful combination. Clarence, these guys, they are beautiful. They are classic bodybuilding. And that's what the world wants to see. What I hope to see is they get paid more and rewarded for keeping bodybuilding where it should be instead of going way over here, yeah. which is, you know, you we want acceptance with the general public, I think, because that's what drew me to bodybuilding. Yeah. When you look at your average teenager or kid, they said, I, I don't want to look like that. Mm -hmm. uh, then, but then it's also impossible to achieve in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, like, golly, you know, that's that's a different kind of a deal. I'm not here to criticize. I'm glad that in the organization there's something for everybody. Sure. But th when that something becomes dangerous, it's not good for the for the sport, period. Mm. Yeah, you bring up an interesting point because there was a gentleman who competed in the Class Physique Olympia last month named Neil Curry. This might come out in February, so I'm talking about the Olympia guys. So Neil is moving to open because he would be 15 pounds over the weight limit for classic physique at like seven to 10 days out. And he would have to do extreme things, including diuretics, including dropping water for days and days to reach that. So he's, he feels it's not even worth it. He's moving. He's going to sit out and put some size on. Actually, I think he's doing the open at the Arnold unless I'm mistaken and he changes mind, but he feels that classic physique, even though they're, they're not as, uh, it's not as dangerous in the sense of they don't have to eat as much food and the PED use isn't as extreme. They do have to get just as lean. You know, Bumstead was in better condition, at least as good, if not better condition, than Hadi Chupan was. And I'm not saying I have, I don't know what he did to achieve that condition or what he didn't do. But I'm saying, again, it's a it's a healthier look, but it's still not healthy to have strided glutes, strided hamstrings, you know, a face like a skull you could sink your fists into the hollows in there i mean uh, i but i don't know what else to do because again when you have a, a lineup of amazing physiques in front of you beautiful shape structure symmetry balance proportion and then you have to start looking you have to start really picking them apart well this guy's really shredded this guy's got a little bit of softness in the lower back or the glutes so i'm going to place this guy higher than that guy you know i don't know if we're going to come up with an answer right here and now Lee, but we need to start talking about this. Yeah. Yeah. It need to be discussed because it, it, it never ends well. Mm -hmm. It never ends well. So the powers that be have to have a conversation about it, you know, and it goes back. I think it goes back to still looking for the Excalibur of physiques, mm -hmm. symmetry, balance, presentation, and a point system that can determine who's going to be that. I mean, you may have striated glutes, but you pose, you, you pose terrible. Mm -hmm. you, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So the point system is a sort of a safe way of determining who that winner will be. Yeah. Yeah, real quick, I don't want to make, this could be a whole other topic for another day, but real quickly, Milo Sarshev has been arguing pretty strongly lately to bring back the judging of the posing round, which was taken away many, many years ago. When you were competing, the opposing round was judged. Uh, but at some point between then and now, I, I can't remember when exactly, they stopped scoring the posing round and guys stopped really coming up with good routines. They stopped putting a lot of time and effort into their presentation. And a lot of them look awkward and clumsy up there. Some of them still put, some of them still take pride in their posing presentation. But just real quick, do you think posing should be, should be judged as part of the competition? There you go. Exactly. As I was saying, a point system needs to be reestablished and posing should be one of those things. Mm. Posing, symmetry and the uh, the mandatory poses, you know, if you do your, your quarter turns, all of that need to be there. Balance, symmetry and presentation and presentation. We, we're talking bodybuilding. We're talking artistry here. Yes. So that's part of the art, being able to display the physique. And that's what made bodybuilding popular. You know, you look in the Frank Zane, McCauley, he waxed my butt all over Europe. <laughs> wow. You know, he really gave me a good lesson 
imposing. And Arnold said that himself. Said Lee, until you get your presentation down, you got a great physique, but you have to learn to display your physique and all the strengths of it, and make sure you don't you don't display any of the weaknesses. So that's an art in itself. Of course, it need to be. Should have never been removed. Yeah, I that think was the, a bad idea. The anyway. symmetry round is not even judged. I don't think there is a symmetry round anymore in the scoring. And that's the problem. Mm. That's another problem. And again, I was saying the symmetry and balance and all of those need to be part of the symmetry and posing. Because if you're scoring, you're being scored in both of those divisions, symmetry and posing and quarter turns and so forth. Then guess what? There, there you go. So the guy with the most ripped butt <laughs> may not win. Because the other guy had a better, better posing routine, and he had better balance and better symmetry. Yeah. You know, so that's something that has always existed when the time in which I competed as a teenager all the way through. Mm -hmm. It was always there. It was never taken away. And so you were expected to get up there and have a great routine. You was expected to create a body that was symmetrical, not have little squatty legs and no calves, and a big broad waist. Mm. That was that was not part of the bodybuilding culture as it was meant to be. Yeah, and I wanna make it clear to everybody, we're not crapping on the bodybuilding culture today or the athletes or the judges. You know, Lee and I, we both spent our entire lives in this sport, we've dedicated our lives to it. You know, I know you and I, we both have a deep, deep passion and love for bodybuilding and bodybuilders. We just want the best for everybody. We want the competitions, to be as great as it can be in every aspect. And we want the athletes to be healthy and enjoy life for many, many years. When I see somebody passing away at 40, 45, 50 years old, sometimes even younger, sometimes in their 30s, and it just, it makes me so sad because, you know, nobody should be, nobody should be dying that young, but especially someone who's extra dedicating their life to exercising and eating right. You know, it, it goes against everything that body is supposed to stand for. Yeah. Um, yeah. re real quickly, uh, you did confide in me that you have a congenital kidney issue that I, I had no idea about. I don't know if you're not comfortable talking about it, that's fine. But I had no idea that, that you were uh, suffering from this. Do you want to talk about it or not? Well, you know, Ron, the good thing, I'm not suffering from it. <laughs> you oh, okay, know? good. I don't want you to suffer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. I'm not sick. I'm not taking medication, that kind of, kind of deal. Yeah. You know, I found out that I was born with something called polycystic kidney disease. Uh, when I'm on my ranch over 20 years ago, I'm out playing with the kids, you know, and one of the billy goats got away. So I pulled out the billy goat to catch him. And I, I found blood in my urine. Hmm. And I said, well, what the heck is this? So I went to my doctor and they did an ultrasound. They said, Lee, somebody in your family has polycystic kidney. And I never knew about it. And I talked to my mom and, you know, I'm saying later years. And she said, uh, my father had a condition with that. And so it was unknown to anybody else. And I didn't know it either. Hmm. So, but I, it was diagnosed. And of course, I went to see a kidney specialist. And he said, well, Lee, uh, how do you feel? I said, man, I feel great. He said, well, if you feel great, man, we'll just keep tabs on it. And, and there you go. Hmm. But of course, you know, being in health and fitness, I wanted to go a little further and find out, okay, since I have this condition, what do I need to do about it? Well, as I studied the nutritional part of it and to maintain good functionality, it said that number one, stay away from red meats, which I never use in my diet. Mm -hmm. I've always a chicken and egg and fish guy. Right. Then it says uh, plenty of fruits and vegetables. Well, sweet potatoes, spinach, and you know, it's always been my mainstay when I train for competitions. Then it says, stay away from alcohol. Well, guess what? I never drank alcohol. So I was always water or some type of tea herbs. So I never had a, a situation concerning that. Then it talks about regular exercise. And so I did all of those things. <laughs> so as a result of that, you know, it could have been, I'm, I could have been in the worst stage, but I'm not because of that. And that was over 20 years ago. Huh. Now I am at a stage four. And the doctor said I'm right around 17%. Mm. So the fact is, I, you know, I'm at the age of 63, the kidney is not going to get any better. Mm. So we're being proactive as far as 
continue to follow good, uh, you know, dietary regimen. Uh, my nutrition consists of rough around 90 percent uh, plant based, which is half since I stopped competing anyway. Mm. And I purposely brought my weight down for 250 pounds. I now weigh around 228 pounds okay. because I realize I'm older. So as you get older, you don't need this additional stress mm. on your heart, on your knees, on your on your joints. So you got to be smart in managing your age or managing your health. So I've purposely done these things. So I'm hoping that, you know, Shirley is going to be my number one, one of my number one daughters. You know, <laughs> she's been with us at age two years, uh, in the second grade. So I'm hoping she'll be a match. But if she don't, then we'll, I'll look, hopefully I'll be blessed with someone who maybe want to do some type of exchange for a kidney with her or someone who would say, well, I'll be willing to donate a kidney you know, in case I'm in need of it. I'm not on dialysis or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So I'm just just thankful that I got my health and I got people that love me, that support me. And I used wisdom, you know, during my early years to make sure that I don't I don't have a problem, you know? Yeah. I'm glad you're glad you're doing okay. But wouldn't your wouldn't Olympia or Josh, your kids, wouldn't wouldn't one of them be a good donor? I would think. Well, what, what that's a know? possibility too. You know, but they're still young. And the one thing that I that you that I could find out, I want to be careful of, if they were to be tested, red flag goes up, then you know, I know how insurance companies work. Yeah. You know, they'll look, oh, we can't grant them a choice because of that. You know, that we 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 gotta deal with systems That's true. and they exist, you know. So that's a concern that I have. So we're going to go to route with Shirley first. And if that don't work, then, you know, we'll just just pray that we receive a donor or somebody that would step forward and say, hey, Lee, ain't it worth keeping the lock? <laughs> well, I mean, Flex Wheeler got a donor from his church years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I got a beautiful church, beautiful people. And uh, we'll just see what happened. You know, God is good. I stand on his word. And that's what I believe. It's all the faith journey. Well, let's switch to a much happier subject. Your IAFS is having an event in a few weeks. Could you please tell us a little bit about that, Lee? Oh, yeah, man. We're having a workshop coming up February the 18th, 1230. uh, And I'll be talking about things such as competing healthy. You know, we're talking about training systems. We're talking about how to manipulate calories. In order to drop body fat and maintain muscle, we'll talk about last minute prep, as I mentioned earlier, how to go about, you know, uh, in a safe way competing for those last few days and getting nice and tight without putting your system into danger Mm -hmm. and how to implement the supplements as you prep for your your competition also. Then we talk about a bit of posing, uh, Sid Gillian. Oh, uh, wow, six okay. times miss the miss uh figure uh yeah. six times world champ olympian see yeah. it is certified under the ifs mm-hmm. she'll be there to help and so forth as a dear friend of mine she's like my other daughter <laughs> so we're gonna have a great time then we have several our other master trainers there on hand so we'll be going over training technique form a q a all of that great stuff to help educate people and is we've opened the ifs up for people just wanting good, solid information. We're talking about ultimate bodybuilding science and functional training. So if you say, well, listen, I'd like to become certified, you have that information. So that's what we're going to be doing there. So we're looking forward to having people go to my website. They can go to leehaney.com and register, or they can go to IAFS certification dot com and register there is this an event people go to or is this going to be you know on like a a big conference call online or how's this going to work oh no it'll be physical it's going to be located here in atlanta so it'll be also at the same time we'll have the npc regional uh network conference going on where vendors are going to be there 
Uh, it'll be open forums happening, talking about posing, all of these type of things to be going on. But uh, within that, that time slot, we'll also have the IAFS certification workshop. So this is going to be a lot of fun. And uh, you can go to, as I said, my website. You can get the information there. Ron, I'm going to send you a link with the information gotcha. so you can blast it out to those who may want to attend. Again, it's February the 18th, uh, located in Atlanta, Georgia, at Burkmore High School. Okay. Burkmore? Burkmore? Yeah, Burkmore uh, High School in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, perfect. Well, I hope uh, a lot of you guys, if you're in that area, I hope you make it down because, you know, this Lee Haney is one of the, the last great resources we have left in the sport from that, what I consider the golden era. You know, so to me, the 70s and 80s, early 90s, to me, maybe it's because of my age, but to me, that was the golden era. Uh, but man, you know, I, I've said this before, Lee, but I mean, I really mean it. You're one of the, one of the few people I know that I always come away from speaking with you, just feeling uplifted and you have so much positivity, so much wisdom. You're always trying to help and make things better for all of us. So I, I thank you so much for, for doing these with me when you do. It's, 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 well, it's, well, Ron, I, I really appreciate you and allow me the time to share and talk to the athletes. And Hey guys, I want you to know this out of love that I'm speaking this to you. I want you guys to enjoy the, the same lineage that us older guys have. And it, it can be done in a safe way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, you know you're, 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 you're playing with your grandchildren and you want everyone to, to have that experience if they want it someday to be able to play with your grandchildren because you need to be a little older typically to do that. Yeah. So. <laughs> your health is your wealth. Absolutely. Cool. Well, I uh, will have all the links in the description, guys. But again, LeeHaney.com or IAFSCertification.com for all the information on the IAFS and particularly for this event that's coming up pretty soon in the uh, Georgia, the Atlanta, Georgia area. So, Lee, thank you so much. Great eight time, Mr. Olympia. Always a pleasure, sir. Always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Ron. Well, God bless it. you. Thanks, guys, for watching. Please subscribe, like, share, do all that good stuff, and leave some comments below. We love your feedback. Thanks for watching Ron Line Report with totally awesome Lee Haney. We'll see you next time. Hey, did you like that video? Smash that like button, subscribe to MD, and please comment down below. Thanks for watching.